ready to go. Hello and welcome to our kickoff of our Mother's Day knit along. Uh, and it's also kind of the kickoff to uh, a spring, a kickoff to April, just a whole great time for us to be together. And um, we're honored tonight to have as our guest speaker, Liz from the Greenleaf Tea Company. And um, I'm gonna uh, interview her here in a minute and we'll do that. And then we'll talk a little bit about those inspirational women in our lives. And then we'll finish with a few tips for the, your, your Mother's Day knit along. As all of you know, this is our sixth annual uh, knit along. And I guess I'm, I'm feeling a little bit sentimental about it. Um, uh, one, that it's been six years, but two, that it, it was so well received. We had, I think when we left the shop today at five, there were 91 Mother's Day uh, knit alongs. And um, I think that's just amazing. I think it's a testament to all of us feeling just some heartstrings when we think about uh, people we want to knit in honor of or think about people that were influential in our lives. And I just love it that we can come together this way uh, in these times, as we all know, uh, that have been challenging and that this allows us to really um, come together and celebrate uh, celebrate a lot of things. And one of the things that's been so amazing, I know for, for myself, is your support of Knit Paper Scissors during this past year. And I know that all of you have supported other local uh, small businesses and really, um, you know, you really, you made, you made it for us. And uh, we're coming out on the other side able to be here and to continue to keep our doors open. And, and that's why I wanted to invite Liz to be part of our Mother's Day knit along, uh, as we call it, Tea for Two, because we think about um, knitting for someone or, or that influential person. And um, Liz has a business right here in Lincoln that you might, I'm gonna ask you to unmute there, Liz, so I'll let you come off. Um, that yeah. you might not even know about. I have seen the little sign often as I drive by on Pine Lake Road and um, made a stop in there and just was so pleasantly surprised to learn about her business. So Liz, give us a wave and oh. there she is. Tell me about how long you had the Greenleaf Tea Company and what inspired you to start the business. Sure. Well, thanks, Angie, for allowing me to come on and talk a bit about tea. This has been, it's an honor. Um, so we opened in 2016. So we're going, get, getting close to five years this fall. Official opening date was early November. So end of 2016. And yeah, we're located 29th and Pine Lake, kind of behind Da Vinci's. It's a little okay. quiet nook they're a little pushed back from those strip areas mm -hmm. um you know well my mom and i love tea love loose leaf tea and so i i grew up with drinking tea and um was very fortunate in that my dad was a college professor and he had a lot of postdocs from asian countries so we were gifted tea a lot. So in addition to drinking, my mom enjoyed um, English breakfast. So in addition to drinking some black tea, really got to love green teas because in Asia, those are um, one of the more popular teas drunk. So grew up drinking it. Um, would go to loose leaf tea stores, you know, when we were traveling or whatnot. Uh, in 2015, I was diagnosed with cancer, and so we were going to a different city um, for treatments, and my parents would take me um, so my husband could be home with the kids on those days, and um, we stopped into a loose leaf tea store, and the idea popped into my head that this would be really great for Lincoln, and that I think, I thought Lincoln could support it. It's a niche so there definitely needed to be a certain amount of population, I guess you could say. But I felt like Lincoln could support it. 
it was just it you know it's it, tea isn't just so much more than just a drink you know um people look at it for you know um medicinal or you know like health benefits um there's a big social aspect it's cultural it's historical so all those aspects sort of intrigue me and it was a good happy dream i guess to get through the rest of the treatments and whatnot and then about a year after i finished chemo um is when we opened up the the store oh wow um, Liz, how, history. how inspiring to know that you were going through such a life uh, uh you know a life change moment with your with your cancer to really think about opening a business I know when I opened my business I, I was scared just to open a business let alone having dealt with something like cancer like you had to so what courage oh well thank you my my family you know was very very supportive and very encouraging fabulous so tell us um Tell, uh, everyone received a mug in their Mother's Day kit with a, uh, with a, um, ste you know, the, what are they called? Infusers. <laughs> okay, yes, that. And I'm just kind of a tea bag girl. So um, uh, I, I'd like to know the difference uh, between loose leaf and, and uh, why you like that. And then Tell us a little bit about the differences of black and green and, and what we need to know to be better tea connoisseurs. Yeah, sounds good. So yeah, I mean, everyone got some black tea and um, it's a flavored tea. Uh, so there were not, not just the tea leaves in, in, in the mix, if you will, but um, tea can be flavored with essential oils, with other botanicals, with dried fruits, those sorts of things um, are flavoring. So there are, well, let me, I'm gonna start with explaining what tea is and then we'll get to what the difference is, if there are differences with DAGs and loose leaf tea. Um, tea comes from a specific plant called the Camilla sinensis. That's its scientific name. And it's been a it's been a plant known to humanity for for you know countless generations, thousands and thousands of years. Um, historians believe historians and botanists believe that it originated in southwest China, um, Yunnan, China, which actually, if you look at a map, butts up against um, India. If, if if you can believe that, all the way on that side of the, the country. Um, and the one reason that they believe that, not just speak from the indigenous people um, having a strong culture and reverence for the tea, but the fact that they find huge old tea trees growing there. Um, and so tea can grow to, you know, a 40 foot tree given the chance. Um, but for cultivation and for tea growing purposes, for drinking, people cultivate the bushes or trees more as bushes. They kind of, you can imagine that middle trunk of the tree, they pull it sideways. So they have these nice flat plucking planes um, for easier picking either by hand or by machine. So all tea comes from this plant. So a green tea, a black tea, a white tea, an oolong, uh, they all come from the same plant. The difference is basically uh, how they're processed and maybe a bit of how they're, or when they're, they're picked. And just like coffee, um, dependent on where tea is grown, it's going to taste different. So a black tea that comes from China is going to be taste different than a black tea that comes from India, um, from the north of India, even in the, su in the southern part of India. And so uh, there's just a, vi a wide range of tea tastes. They estimate over 10,000 different types of tea, and that's just unflavored. Um, so the five, five main categories of tea 
are white, green, oolong, black, and pu'er, which is P-U-E-R-H. Um, and I would say if you are a tea connoisseur, you would know about pu'er, but it definitely came into America's focal point a few years ago with that book, the, the uh, Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane. That speaks a lot about tea and specifically pu'ers. Um, they are fermented. So a white tea is basically just the early spring picked leaves that they pluck um, when the leaves sometimes aren't even opened. And um, it's a very minimally processed tea. A green tea also often is a spring picked green or a spring, a spring picked tea, um, but they heat treat it. So it doesn't oxidize, which why it's why it looks very nice and green both the leaf and then when you brew it, it's sort of like that nice amber green color. Um, oolong is a half oxidized tea, so it's a wide range. It could be somewhere closer to green all the way to a little bit more oxidized, closer to a black tea. Um, it's a, that's a very long artisan process that each family um, passes down their own method for making their oolongs. And then you have black teas. So black teas are completely oxidized, which is like the same process that happens when you cut a apple or banana, it starts to turn brown. It's the same thing that happens with those leaves. Once you pick them, let them wither a bit, they crush them up so their juices are exposed and then let that oxidize. So it's a nice, strong, robust um, tea. The last one is pu'er and that's a fermented tea. So it starts kind of like a green tea, but then just like sauerkraut, you know, or, or some sort of probiotic uh, food, they, they, they pile it up in, in piles or they push them into cakes um, while they're still sort of wet. There's still enzymatic activity going on. Um, in the old days, they would just let it sit. Nowadays, to speed things up, sometimes they'll introduce you know the the fermenting bacteria to the leaves and just kind of let it sit and cook for 12 months to to years and it produces its own sort of tea that um, is good for you know digestion and actually has naturally occurring statins in it so um, wow yeah some people drink it for cholesterol control mm -hmm. um so loose leaf tea is literally the leaf that has been dried, whichever, you know, version you have, a white or a green, um, that then is sorted and graded. So you can imagine as a, a farmer or as a, a plant using machinery is processing these leaves, they're going to get leaves that are nice and whole. They're going to get leaves that are maybe broken a bit going all the way down to dust almost like little bits of the leaf because i mean if you've ever even opened up the tea bag or just well actually like in the fall you know if you pick up a leaf that's fallen on the ground and it's dry it gets crumbly so it's sort of the same thing imagine a tea leaf crumbling um and so the loose leaf tea is is graded and it's sorted um and the nice long whole leaves are put aside for like loose leaf tea um, consumption and the more broken bits or the dust is what is used for um, tea bags. Uh, it's beneficial for the tea bags because obviously it takes up a lot less space so you don't have to use as much paper in you know to, to encase the tea. It also helps it brew very quickly. So for example, for a loose leaf tea, black tea, um, four to, you, you wanna actually have those leaves sitting in the water four to five minutes, but you typically wouldn't do that for a tea bag. But the pieces are so small, there's just so much more surface area. Um, so they brew quicker and you can get like a pretty stout cup. The bad part about that is that those pieces, since they do have more surface area, they oxidize more quickly, they sort of age more quickly, and they also lose their essential oils and other 
compounds, you know, in the leaf. And so typically you don't get as much flavor from a tea bag and you don't get as many health benefits and just that, that nice tea experience. And so you can certainly get a good cup of tea with a tea bag. I would say you can't get, or I would argue, I guess you, that you couldn't get that really premium um, tea taste. If you haven't tried different types of loose leaf teas, um, you will be astonished with the range of tastes, even you know, just for black tea, um, how many nuances and flavors there are. It's, it's like wine, it's like tasting wine um, and being a wine connoisseur. So it's the same way with, with teas and you just don't get those nuances and those tasting notes. Wow. Um, in a tea bag. But that being said, I mean, I have some bags of tea at home too. It's also the reality of, of life that you may not always be able to sit down and take the time to brew your tea, but it's definitely worth it. Um, does the water temperature differ then? Um, not between a bag to the loose leaf tea, but the water temperature does differ between the types of tea, um, white teas and green teas in particular, and some oolongs. Um, because of the way they're processed, they're more delicate. And so hot, like really hot water, i.e. boiling water, can sort of scald or cook the leaves, giving it a more bitter taste. And I would say probably we're all familiar with that tannicky bitter, not so fun taste of tea. And the two ways that you get that taste, well, three, but the two main reasons are um, you've used too hot of water and it sort of scalded the leaves or you've let the tea steep for too long. There's a certain compound in the leaf that is that bitter taste and it's a very big compound and it just takes a long, it, the longer the water sits on those leaves, the more chance those big compounds can leave the tea and get into your cup and make it sort of bitter. So yeah, wow. green teas, white teas, you don't want boiling water. If, if your water gets to boiling, which is great, whoop, there's my cat, um, you just wanna take it off the heat and let it sit a few minutes before you pour your tea. Good question. Yeah, well, I have one of those teapots that you can set the temperature mm -hmm. of the water to boil the water, and it's got like the different teas on it. So yeah. I, I thought there must be some truth to that. Mm -hmm. um, wow, I've I've already learned a bunch. Um, tell tell us what we can get when we come to your store. Um, I know that's tea. <laughs> But uh, uh, how, uh, I, I think I saw some tea lattes or, you know, what, what, what kinds of things can I get when I come? Yeah, totally. So, I mean, the vision when we started this store was definitely like retail loose leaf teas, but I wanted to be able to serve the tea because I felt like that was really important and it helped people get that tea experience too. Um, we made the decision that it was not going to be you know, in bags, nor would we put the tea in the bag and just give it to the customer as traditional in a lot of like coffee shops or whatnot. We brew them for the specific time with the specific temperature and then we hand it off to the customer just so that that way you can um, be assured that it's, you know, brewed the way sort of it, the, the best way possible. So you can really try that tea for how it should be. Um, but yeah, then we started getting wacky and crazy because there are so many options with tea, you know, so like the bubble teas, which is a drink, a fad that came from Taiwan in the 1980s. Um, yeah, tea lattes, obviously a chai latte. So like, um, you know, really that, that the, the, the classic proper way, I, it, I would say, you know, like brewing your masala chai tea and then adding milk and honey to it. So everything is, I'm, I, I guess the, the cancer definitely pushed me towards the spectrum of sort of all natural and, and organic, 
but I, I think I was like that a bit before too. So I try really hard with the drinks to, you know, not have like syrup concentrates or whatnot to, to, to let the tea flavors shine through um, because the tea is so flavorful in and of itself that mm -hmm. you don't really need, you know, like a whole, a whole lot else. So, and as we've go, gone along, you know, yeah, we get some really wacky, crazy flavors as the, as in Pinterest has really gotten popular, vis, the visual range of drinks in general has in, like the demand for it has increased. So it's fun to play around with the different colors and textures that your tea drinks can do because oh it's visually fun too. Oh my. <laughs> and so, yeah, and then we do high tea. Well, pre-COVID we did high teas too, which we will again eventually, which is, is more like a lunch service with tea. Um, Fabulous. Yeah, that's I had a customer come in and uh, she said, have you been to your Liz's high tea? Becky, I think you said that today, or somebody did, Sarah. And uh, uh, I said, well, I don't think she's having it right now. So, um, but in the future, uh, that will be something we can all look forward to. Is there anyone that has one or two questions for Liz? You can raise your hand. You can raise it this way, or you can raise it on your, uh, on <laughs> your, okay, we'll take Liz. Liz or Diana first. Sorry, Diana, you have to go off mute. And then Connie, you'll be next. Okay. Would you happen to have tea tastings? Yeah, yeah, we do have it's kind of pre 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 pandemic, I guess you could say. But yeah, we would have classes and some free demos and tastings. Um, this Saturday, since the weather's looking like it's going to be really nice, we'll do a small um, sample Saturday and have some some tea ta some tea samples outside for people to drink in the afternoon. But yes, we do we do that and some comparative tastings, which would be like having two teas side by side so you can taste each one and you know judge the differences in that. So yes, good question. We do. Great, you can come to Knit Paper Scissors and then you can go get some tea. We're all having outdoor events. There we go. Nice. <laughs> Connie, did you have a question? Well, I, what is bubble tea? I see that, but I have no idea what it is or how it's prepared or anything about it. Well, so I mean, it it is really the chef's prerogative, if you will, or barista's prerogative on how it's made nowadays. Um, Traditionally, it was a iced black tea with copious amounts of uh, sugar and milk that was shaken up um, until it almost got frothy on the top, hence the name bubble tea. Um, hmm. with, but then over time, they began adding um, tapioca balls. So giant, like a quarter inch size tapioca balls, or they call them pearls, tapioca pearls into the bottom of the drink. So you drink it with a really large straw. So you're drinking your drink and then, you know, one of these um, tapioca balls pop into your mouth and you put it down. It's like a gummy bear texture. Um, in, in, it's a very big philosophy in, in Asian cultures that drinks encompass all five senses. So the bubble teas have that visual appeal and that you have these dark balls, you know, on the bottom of your drink and often very colored drink. You know, you have this, the taste, that mouth texture, the difference, you know, so it, 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 the idea being that it encompasses all five senses. Um, nowadays, there's a wide range and a lot of bubble teas and a lot of quote unquote bubble teas don't even have actual tea in them. They're more like a smoothie, if you will, you know, a blended milkshake almost with the, with some sort of textural element. So now they don't just have the tapioca pearls. They have like bursting boba and jellies and aloe vera little squares or maybe not. Al yeah. Aloe squares. So it's, it's, it's a huge thing. They're, they are sweet, so there is sugar in them. And you do have to ask, you know, if there's any allergies, because a lot of them um, do have milk or other, you know, 
things in them, but in essence, it is a tea drink it, with texture. There we go. Thank you. That's interesting. Andy. Uh huh. Yes, Sylvia. Yes, I'm wondering about Robio's tea. I drink tea every evening, but I want lower caffeine. So, what would you recommend? And is Robio's less caffeine? Yeah, so so Roybus is um, it's not actually a so it's 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 an Afri so it's uh, Afrikaans name, and it's Roybus like Roy and then bus as as a bus. Okay. Um, it comes from South Africa. It's not actually tea like from a tea plant. It's a different plant that's in what they call the Finbos family, um, which is another. Afrikaans name meanings are like fine fingered feathers and it's a good tea substitute. So way back when the Dutch were some of the first white settlers colonizing South Africa, uh, they found through learning from the um, local indigenous people, this plant made a good sort of tea substitute or herbal tea as we would call it. Um, so there's absolutely no caffeine in rooibos. Um, so it's completely suitable for evening or just any time that you don't want to have caffeine. And it makes a good, you know, rich, rich tea tasting substitute. So yeah, that's a great option for, for evening time. Great question. Great question. Well, if you are a sock knitter, um, we're having our uh, special nine to 10 event for you that those of you that have submitted your completed socks, you still have time. You've got till Wednesday. <laughs> um, and uh, we're going to have that on Saturday morning. And Liz uh, gave me a, one of her scones when I was in picking up the tea for our Mother's Day gifts. And oh my, it was just the most lovely one that she just gave to me. Um, but also um, that it was super, super yummy. So kind of keeping within that theme, we will have a stone on a Saturday morning uh, there at the shop for those of you that have participated in our sock. So like I said, you still got time, 48 hours, you can make a sock. You couldn't do anything else, but you could make you could make a sock and and get in on uh, Liz. So Liz, again, your shop is located behind Da Vinci's, right? On, kind of where South Point. Those of you, we have a lot of folks that aren't from Lincoln, South Point, and then Pine Lake, and then Da Vinci's is there, and she's right right behind there. Um, I would encourage you to to go visit Liz. I, every time I've come in, you've been there. So I know what that's like as small business. That must have been your mom in there the other day. Yeah, my parents, my parents yeah. hang out there a fair amount. And uh, yeah, actually my son will be helping with this sample Saturday. So yeah, it's kind of a family affair. But I, I mean, my parents and I actually ran a company previous to the tea store um, before they retired so it's yeah it's sort of a it, it'd be weird to run someplace without having family around actually that's great well let's give liz a uh thank you oh, thank you hours. good question um so the shop is open tuesday through saturdays tuesday uh, tuesday through friday 10 to 5 and then on saturdays 10 to 4. And then over Christmas time, we're open on Sundays too, but this time of year, Tuesday through Saturday. Fabulous. Well, Liz, thank you for your willingness. I know I showed up at the shop and said, hey, I got this idea and this collaboration and I'd like some of your tea. And I think she looked at me like, who is this lady? And she <laughs> wouldn't be the first one to look at me that way. So um, uh, she was just all on board and I hope you all enjoy your tea. Does anybody have their cup? With your tea, anybody got the, your cup that you're holding with your, there's Hi. Julie, she's got a cup of tea going on, Karen's got hers, aren't those nice mugs? 
Yes. Well, Liz, you can stay on, but we're gonna do a, we're gonna do a little knitting and knit talk. And you can stay and and listen if you want. But if not, thank you, and uh, we'll plan to see you at your store. And I'll see you Saturday morning to get those scones. Sounds great. Yes, thank vanilla you scones. So. Yeah. Thank you again so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful time tonight. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, fabulous. How, how, what, wow. Isn't it good to learn these things? I mean, really, it makes me more, I'm, I'm kind of a coffee girl. And I, I told Liz that, that I, I drink more coffee than I do tea, but um, I like supporting local small business. So get on over there and um, stop by. And I think it's fun to, to learn about some tea. So let's talk a little bit about this little exciting Mother's Day event that we have uh, going on. I think you're all knitting. Um, let me just give you a little bit of background about how we work to come up with our knit alongs. Um, we kind of go on hunts for patterns. We think about what yarns we're gonna use. We think about um, uh, difficulty, if it can be replicated, if you can do it from home, if you need to come into the shop, all of those things. Um, and then we test knit and, um, and then we fall in love with the project and then we hate the project and then we fall in love with it and then we think it's fabulous. So um, we try to prove things and we get things right most of the time. And then Valerie calls me yesterday at three in the afternoon and I'm like, I know why she's calling because I knew she was working on something. So we do have just a minor correction that will uh, share with you tonight. So we do try to put a lot of thought into it and it's more than just a knit along. Um, you know, I find it interesting that um, we have the most participants in this knit along and this is the simplest knit along we've ever done. And uh, you know, it is more than just the difficulty of the project or uh, the technique or those things. It's kind of about being together uh, and, and just being part of it, even though we're apart, we're still part of all of this together. And as we were preparing, I asked staff um, to give me four names of women in their life that were influential. And uh, so they got right on that. They got, got me their names. And so every Monday, we're gonna just be sharing a little bit about some of those women and how they were influential uh, for us so that you can learn about the June, the, uh, the Gladys, you know, did any of you buy it because of the name? Anybody, anybody pick a bit because of the name? Some, I had some folks say, I'm going to knit my grandma <laughs> um, or knit in honor of. And uh, so I'm going to go, I'm going to go to my, um, screen share and um, I'm going to show you, I'm sharing tonight about my grandmother, Helen. Of course, you know that um, we talked about Helen when we had Helen the hibiscus. And um, so I wanna show you a picture of her, whoop, I'm froze. Hang in there. Here we go, coming. Takes a little bit for it to get to talking. Screen share, not now. Okay. Go. Maybe. Try it again. Sorry. You know. Second time might be the charm. There we go. So this is my grandma Helen. And um, her name was Helen Sweetser. And uh, she married my grandfather, Clark. And we called him Shorty Hudson. And this was <laughs> this was shortly after they were married. How would you like to be wearing overalls? Um, uh, shortly, uh, shortly after after they were married. I love her hair. I love she actually. You know, I'm wondering if she was a little taller because as I know my grandma, I think of her as a little grandma. You know, as we kind of shrink as we. Uh, as we go along in, in our life. But um, she was born in Fairbury in 1914. 
And so I thought of that. Uh, she, you know, she would have turned a hundred here in 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 2014, and um, she lived uh, until she was 94 years old. But she got married at 21, and um, we have a nice family history. So I'm just going to share a little bit about uh, from that history. It said that after getting married, they stayed with Shorty's parents for two weeks. So imagine that, getting married and staying with your in-laws for two weeks. And there were no jobs, so they decided to go to Wyoming, as some of his brothers lived out there. And um, they went to Powell, Wyoming, which is close to Yellowstone Park. And um, the, they uh, were called to herd, get this, sheep. I thought that was just kind of appropriate. Sheep in the high mountain range. And so they were taken by uh, truck and then by horse and buckboard. And they lived in a cabin that had pack rats and holes in the door that were put there by the previous owner because he had been afraid of bears. So he shot at any noise he heard in this cabin. And um, I have a picture, this picture here. It's of my grandfather. But this is the this is the cabin they lived in. Um, I mean, it's just it's like what you read about in um, Laura Ingalls Wilder, and so this is where they lived um, up in Wyoming uh, while they were herding sheep, and um, uh, they would herd they herd they herded twenty two thousand sheep, and it was the last to be sheared because they were the highest up in the mountain. And at night they would flag the sheep. So I don't quite know what that would mean, but flag the sheep, maybe put them in, kind of corral them. So the coyotes would not get the lambs. And um, before in the morning, Shorty, so her husband would point in the direction he was going to be and would just expect Helen to find him. Think about how we're all so connected today with our phones and our GPS and all that. Can you imagine just him pointing and saying, I'm going to be in this direction? Luckily, Helen was not afraid to walk where Shorty was herding sheep. And one day it rained and sleeted on her before she found him. And her only shelter was a bush. They never saw bear in the high country, but they were fortunate enough to have a herd of wild horses remain in the area. Their transportation was a horse or buckboard and it was rough riding in the, buck, in the buckboard. One time, Helen was holding on so tight she got blood poisoning in her hand and he, Shorty took her 75 miles down to Pal to the doctor. She stayed there a week with friends while Shorty returned to the high country. Um, and so uh, they did that for a summer. And um, after that, they headed back down to Powell and, and finished out the summer. And then they decided to move back, uh, back to Nebraska. And so then they farmed outside of Fairbury, actually outside of Janssen and uh, down in Reynolds, Kansas. And, and I guess the thing that I remember uh, most, about, um, most about my grandmother was what a hard worker she was. And, um, and hard, hard. I mean, she could do anything on the farm. And of course she was a great cook. And I think I've shared this story, but I remember as did we butchered chickens. And, um, but you know, we butchered chickens all day long and then we ate chicken for dinner. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm not really a fan of fried chicken because it's like all that, you know, all the things you do. How many chickens have been around butchering chickens? Okay, you know, just all the things, yeah, all the things that happen. And so um, I remember her just being sweet, mild-mannered. I was the first granddaughter, grandchild. So they were big horse people and I was not a horse person. And I, I know that I was a disappointment in my horse and, and that my horse skills were not uh, very much there, but I always got to go stay with them. And that was really special um, to be able to go stay with her. Uh, many of you know that she's my knitting grandmother and um, she learned to knit in later in life. So my aunt, her daughter taught her to knit. 
And as you know, she knit the baby sweaters, or maybe you don't, but this is what inspired me to knit was the little sweet baby sweaters that she made. This is my Andrews. Still looks as good as 26 years ago because it's that good old red heart yarn that never dies. And um, that's what inspired me to knit was this little baby sweater. And um, if she made one, she made a, a hundred, a hundred of them. And I think the final memory I kind of have of her is after my grandfather passed away, he died of an aneurysm driving down the road. He's, she, she grabbed the wheel and that was it. And uh, they raced horses. So in Nebraska, there is a horse, uh, there is a thoroughbred circuit. And you went to Grand Island and then you went to Exarban and then you went to Lincoln and then you finished in Columbus. And they did that for years. And they had this trailer house that they'd moved to Fauner Park and then they'd have their horses and she cleaned the stalls. And, um, and after my grandfather died, she went to the racetrack by herself and took her horses to the, and she wasn't really the horse girl. He was the horse guy, um, but you know how it is. Um, you're in it and so you learn it. And um, she went and raced those horses by herself after he passed away and uh, took them to the different uh, racetracks and raced them. So uh, she was a tough gal. And um, I think of kind of how pampered we are today and think about what I would think if my daughter lived for two weeks and after they were married for two weeks and then we're gonna go to the high mountain in Wyoming. You know, we're, we're pretty orchestrated today, aren't we? So she's always been an inspiration uh, for me and obviously for my knitting. I never learned to knit from her. Uh, so she would just be nothing more than thrilled. She just, she always just gets so excited. Just this cute little gal gets so excited. So she would, I can hear what she would say today as she thinks about, as she thinks about my knit shop. So we're going to be sharing some of those stories and uh, about those people that inspire us and hopefully give you an opportunity, um, opportunity to share some of those things as we go along as well. Um, just to, as we review our schedule, next week's in Nomadic Knits, Becky and Melissa will be with us. They are lovely, lovely girls that started that business. And uh, you'll get to preview the Iowa, Nebraska issue. Uh, and then the following week is Jan from Sadar or Rowan. She's a lovely gal out of San Jose, California. Um, she's been in the knit business for a long time. And then uh, the third one will be Jessica and Allison, who are our dyers, that will talk about dyeing yarn. And then we're going to finish with our Mother's Day fashion show, of which we had a lovely fashion show for our Embrace the Chill. So let's talk about your projects. Who's working on it? How's it going? Let's see. Anybody hold them up? Let's give them a, oh my gosh. Oh, look at you guys go. Woohoo! fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a couple things and then um, I'll take any questions. I'm gonna go back to my screen share. I learned this from my friend, Susan Feely, who teaches our sweater classes. And um, she, uh, she did some filming. Um, there's my sock knitters today. There we see some familiar faces. You get to see all these folks. See what I get to do. Okay, so we're gonna show, I'm gonna show this video on how to, how to um, add in yarn. So I wanna show you how I do that. I simply insert into the first stitch, slip on the new color and knit it. And then I'm gonna knit the second stitch. And the third stitch. And at that point, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna give these just a gentle tug. Um, they're gonna be really loose and I'm, I'm just gonna let them wait there until I come back. And then I'm gonna knit down to the end and then I'm gonna show you a trick I do for knitting to uh, knitting to together. So 
So we'll get down to the end. And on each of our garter rows, we knit to the last three stitches. And then we're going to knit two together, knit one, and turn. So I'm down to the last three. What I like to do is I pinch the fabric between my index finger and my thumb, and I give it kind of a pull down. You can kind of see how it's moving down. And that makes it much easier for me to get in and do my knit two together. And that's the first row and how we've added um, our second color of yarn. I'll show you what we do when we come back. Okay, so that is adding in the yarn. And now we'll, oh, here we go again. So now we'll talk about um, how we switch our yarns. Okay, here we are coming up to the end. You can see where I've added the new yarn in. This is going to be kind of open uh, looking. I'm going to knit these last two stitches. I'm going to do a yarn over. It's going to be real loose. You can even hold on to that tail there, yarn over, and knit this stitch. And then I'm going to give it a cinch up again. Um, just gently. Doesn't have You don't have to kill it and, and tug it close. Then I'm going to turn around. And it's like, all right, now I need to knit with my first yarn, my A yarn, what do I do? Uh, there's no need to cut your yarn as you go along. Um, you simply are going to bring it over um, the yarn you just finished with, and that will trap that yarn when we're ready to come back. And so I bring it over, and then I'm going to knit the first stitch, and this will be loose because it was added in. Don't worry, knit it, yarn over, knit your second stitch, knit your third stitch, and then come back and snug them up again. Again, they don't have to be just be super tight, but just nice and snug. And then these will all get cleaned up and look nice when you weave them in. Now you go ahead and knit with your color A. Okay, so that is our uh, tutorials. Um, I want to show you one other thing here then as we get to the lace portion. So now you can see, let's, let's zoom in here, how we're carrying up. See how they're just, just twisted a smidge there. And don't worry if you didn't do it. It's okay. You know, when it's wrapped around you, you don't see that stuff. But um, you can also see where this is pretty snug now. So remember how loose it was and felt when we, um, when we added the yarn in. It's really, it's, it doesn't, doesn't look too large. And we will be teaching how to weave your, your ends in. I know um, some of you have asked about weaving in ends as you go. Um, that's kind of a personal preference. I usually don't do that. I've been burned too many times with having to take it out. So, um, but I know sometimes we want, you know, you don't like having, having the ends. One of the things I'll, sometimes you can do is take those little clips that we often talk about and you can, you can clip it there so that the tails aren't hanging around uh, with you. Okay, now we're ready for the eyelet portion of it. And I guess the thing, I love these and I found these stoppers to be super helpful with this project because the more, the sooner you get more yarn on your, the more stitches on your project, I've had this fall off. Well, then sometimes it's hard to recover the yarn over. So I, and especially when I'm counting, I put the stoppers on so that then I can push it right up to the count and it doesn't bother me. I know some of you have it or you have some other ones like it. And the other important thing is that you've got this yarn over that you work right away and a yarn over when you come back. So you're double increasing and that's what makes this grow uh, quicker. Um, so now I'm ready to do the next eyelet row. And if you notice, your project starts the same. Let me get to my thing. 
your project starts to the same each the same way on your eyelet section. So it's a knit one and then a yarn over, yarn over, and then it is knit two. So there's two yarn overs kind of right away. And sometimes when I've gotten off on my count, I think it's because I've forgotten that I have this one and then I do an immediate yarn over again. So you yarn over again and then you knit two together. So again, I'm pulling that down just a smidge so I can get my needle into the stitches. And then always after the yarn, always after the knit two together is another yarn over. And then it's knit two. No, I'm sorry. Hang on. I did it wrong. After your knit two together, it's knit two. And then I told Valerie today, I know this pattern by heart, obviously I don't. Um, and then you yarn over and then you knit two together. Now, this is what I want to show you that the stitch that looks directly above, it feels like it looks directly above that eyelet is your knit two together, okay? And that's how you can tell right away that you're on. And you're also gonna have that little kind of stair step look. When I first did that, I'm like, well, that's kind of gappy, but that's how the pattern is designed. So you knit two together, you knit two, and then you yarn over and I can see it, it looks like it's above, it's really kind of to the side, but it looks like it's right above that. If I were getting ready to do my knit two together here, that would be wrong, okay? So you'll get to the point where you can yarn over, knit two together, and then take a moment to kind of give it a look to make sure that they're stacking up on top of each other. And then there's always going to be these three stitches between your eyelets three stitches between your eyelets. Now, when you come back, you want to make sure not to lose those yarn overs. And sometimes if you get off on your count, it might be because we've lost a yarn over. If you lose, if you're coming along here and your yarn over isn't there, let's say it's not there. Now, well, I thought it wasn't. <laughs> Let me see if I can take it off. There we go. So we've knit this two together and you're supposed to have that yarn over in there, you can just go down and make your yarn over. So you're coming back, you can go down, grab it, put it up on your needle and knit it, okay? So you can look for your yarn overs. I think that's what's kind of fun about this project is it does allow you to really get really familiar, um, really familiar with your knitting. One other thing I would tell you when you get to your, because counting, you know, you can, you can count it all or you don't have to count it. You'll get the rhythm of it. But when I count my, um, when I count my garter rows, I put a marker in here and a marker over here, so to speak. So I would put like, let's say this is 25 stitches. You can't go all the way here because you're going to, you're going to knit two together. And over here, it's going to grow. So you could put a marker here and then you could come over and count 30 stitches and put a marker here. And then that way you don't have to count those 30 stitches all the time. It becomes very helpful at the end when you're trying to make sure that you're on track. And of course, what's really garter, you can kind of fudge that, but when you get to your eyelet section, it's important that you've got the right counts going on. Um, in your eyelet section. So do you have any questions or things that you've encountered that you would like some help with? Yes, Gwen. Um, I'd like to know, um, you mentioned that the yarn that you're carrying up the side when you change colors, how important is it that you bring it over the top or underneath? or does it really matter? You know, I think it's what's important is that you're consistent so okay. that it kind of looks the same way as you're doing it. Well, I, when you said that, I'm like, whoops, I've been doing it under. So that's all right. That's all right. Okay. I didn't know if it produce a different edge maybe. No, no, it'll just be how the, how the yarns are laying there. Where it does become important is the next garter section. When you start, when you have two rows of garter, so you'll go down and back, and then you want to catch it 
down and back. Because if you don't catch it after that second, uh, before you do your second garter row, then you have a really long yarn there. Um, let me show you. Oh, that would be good. Take it off. Other questions? Things you've run into. Woo. Hang on. I love wearing these. I'm making my third one. Oh, wow. I don't make more of anything other than socks. And um, so uh, I have to tell you, I just love it. I love wearing it. This is my denim revive. So when you get, I'm off camera for the other, but like here, this section is a three, three garter rows. I trap, I trap that each time because if you didn't, you'd have a very, you'd have like a whole inch of blue right up here. So I catch that every time on the garter row, even though I'm not working with it, I'm catching it and trapping it, okay? Which was your favorite fiber to knit with? All of them. <laughs> I'm serious, I'm serious. I have loved each and every one that I have worked with and I liked it because of the, the different experience uh, the different experience of them. Susan, did you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, now, my, my pattern says a size seven needle in uh -huh. 40 inch, 40 inches. You'll eventually um, get to 40. Well, I don't have a, um, a 40 inch loop. So do you have other 40 inch loops there? We do, we do. You could start with a 24. Okay, and then switch? Yeah. Well, I I'll have to... my first one on a 32 the whole way. Really? My just work close together, but it's doable. It's okay. doable. Susan Feely, she sometimes likes to do it on shorter cords so you don't have as much pushing and pulling kind of thing. Well, anyway, I think it's like um, 36 maybe? Yeah. 32, probably 32 or 32. Four. Okay. 32. Well, I'll start with that. And if it doesn't, if yeah. it gets too short, I'll get something, I'll get something yeah. from you. My kid yeah. says I have a 40 inch, but I do not have one. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you have a cord maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. You start with your 24 and get going. All okay. right. I will do that. Thank you. Other questions or things you encountered, things that you need, uh, that you need help with. Brenda, did you have a question? Okay. Angie, how important it is to go with this? Like, am I supposed to know how many stitches I have on my needles? At the end of each section. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of each section. No, you don't have to use those charts at all. You know, we put those charts in because we have all skill levels knitting this. So from our very beginners to advanced and so no you don't have to use a chart at all but it is important when you get ready to do your eyelet section that you've got the right count how do i know what i'm supposed to have well it says it on your pattern okay or on your chart so at the end of each section it has it has the the total number of stitches okay okay we can help you valerie what's our What's our correction to our pattern that you called me yesterday? And I'm like, oh, Valerie's calling me on Sunday. Something's yes. up. So when you get to part six, down to part six, your last eyelet section, it says you're going to use color C, but you're not. You're going to use color A for the last eyelet section. So every row in part six is color A. Okay. And then the first two in section seven. And then the first two in section seven. Yeah. Yeah. That way you have an eyelet section in every one of the three colors that you have. We'll resend the pattern tomorrow, but it's really, you don't have to reprint it. It's yeah, just... that's the only thing there is. The stitches are correct. The count's correct. It's just that last eyelet section is in A, not C. And I think we were talking, we felt like it was the third section. So we had C in our head, mm -hmm. but it's really more about the color 
than it is that it's the third eyelet section. Um, you know, you're gonna have some extra yarn. And so you could enlarge different portions of this if you want. If you enlarge different portions, it does throw how your eyelet ends off. But it will end either at four stitches or five stitches or three stitches or two, right, Valerie? Is it that how, how it worked out for us? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, once you do it, once you do the first one, two, three, you can just keep going. And if you don't, you don't have to follow the pattern. Um, you can just keep at it. And if you want it larger in a different section, you certainly will be able to, to make it to make it larger. Every kit has some extra yarn in it. And we do that because some of you use more, some of you use less. We don't want you to run out. And so we gave you the, the tea cozy so that we could have that uh, as a pattern or any of our dishcloths. Any of this yarn would make fabulous dishcloths, anything like that. Yeah. Any a other- A very easy section to increase would just be that final in that final section, section seven. You can put however many stripes in there you want if you want to use up your yarn. It's totally up to you. Yeah, Angie's got three stripes there and then she bound off on on a different color. So that is, that's a very easy way to make it bigger if you want to make it bigger. I, I really like to bind off. So when I get ready to bind off, I'm ready to do that row. I just grab this other yarn, the white yarn, and I just started doing my bind off. Nothing fancy. I just used a different yarn. Yep. Okay. So you get to be a bit of a designer with it. Definitely. And the extra increases really make it nice and um, oh, wearable. Sometimes mm -hmm. this gets tight on shawls, but on this one, it, it certainly mm -hmm. does not. Mm -hmm. And so that's what all those yarn overs, all those yarn overs are about. Yeah. Other questions? What did you say about the color in seven? You started to say something about the couple things in seven too? The first two rows are done in A. a. Mm -hmm. Okay. On, on that page for the charts of six and seven, your C should be an A. Okay, we're gonna have our drawing for our teapot. I've got everyone's names. We got a, a whole bunch of names in here. I, Valerie, I have that teapot. I didn't come home with me. I don't know where it went. I must be sitting there on the table. <laughs> um, so we're going to draw. One of you are going to win that lovely little white teapot. You all have seen it. I got so many. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I'm not looking. I'm pulling out. This is our winner. Tonight's teapot is Sarah Macis. Sarah, mm -hmm. you have won our teapot. Yay. Mm -hmm. So we'll let Sarah know. And um, thank you all for participating. Thank you for just uh, being lovely and knitting in honor. And um, you're going to love knitting this. Yeah, and there's no, we gave you some timelines, but there's, you know, we're just being very relaxed about all that post pandemic year almost post pandemic year and just be kind to yourself do what you want you want it you want it done by Saturday finish it up that's okay <laughs> you don't want to do it until the end of the month that's okay you want to do it in July that's okay too but we will have a fashion show so um, and for all of you that get it done by that last Monday in April we'll put your name back in a drawing and give away another teapot so thank you for being on. I hope you can join us next week. This will be up on YouTube. So you can go, you would scroll to the end if you wanna see the tutorials. I will not be sending it out as a link. So it just goes up automatically. So you can go to my YouTube channel and search under Mother's Day Cal and there it will be and you'll be able to watch it again. So can I have a question about your next project, the brioche? Mm -hmm. Um, is the homework for that a lot of work prior to 22 stitches and then you have to get to 150 stitches so not bad right no it's no. all in, all in perspective <laughs> 22 stitches by next Tuesday 
150 stitches by the following Tuesday. Yeah, on your needle. On your needle, yep. So, you bet, love yeah. to have you. We got lots of folks doing it. And you just go in and hit, do you like pay or just hit for you a add it to your cart and check out and then it won't ask you for any money. And then, um, uh, then we get it, we get it notified and that's really helpful for us. <laughs> we get a lot of, we, we have a hundred things going on every day. And so if you do that, then we print it and put you in the file. So and then you just come into the store to pick out your, your yeah. fabric then, right? Yep. Or yarn. Yep. Yep. Angie. Uh-huh. I'm not going to be able to make the Zoom next Tuesday because I'm doing the election. Mm -hmm. Will it be on YouTube? Yep, it's always recorded. You bet. Always. You bet. Thank you. Uh huh. You bet. Thanks. All right. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Bye -bye. Enjoy your evening. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. bye, -bye.